We got it. Okay, we've got a couple more people just joined. Awesome. All right. Go, Kelsey, take Perfect. it away. All right, welcome everybody. So excited to see so many friendly faces on the call. I'm so happy to have all of you here. We're very fortunate to be joined by David Asher tonight. Hi, David. Hey, Kelsey. Hi, David. Great to see you. Hi, Great to see you too. Hi, so everyone. I, so I know we've got uh, a lot of uh, returning uh, people to the Canadian Cheese Collective call, but lots of uh, new faces too. So before we start our chat, just want to give a, a quick overview of what the Canadian Cheese Collective is. So the Canadian Cheese Collective is a very loose organization that is uh, focused on education and building community within the Canadian cheese industry. So it's something that Aaron and I are doing as volunteers. It's not paid and we're not asking anybody to uh, pay to join these calls. Everything's totally volunteer driven. Uh, this is something that we've been talking about for years and years. And uh, with the rise of video conferencing, now is the time to do it. So, so excited to have you all here. Uh, usually we interview two guests on each of our Canadian Cheese Collective calls, but uh, we've found that sometimes we run out of time and we, we don't want to run out of time today. We've got a very special guest and we could probably spend whole days and weeks uh, chatting with David about uh, his, uh, his expertise in natural cheese making and just his journeys and his interests around the world. So I'll hand it over to Aaron for a quick intro and then we'll get to our chat. Yeah, so I had a little pre-meeting with David a couple of weeks ago and kind of quickly realized that there was just so much we wanted to talk about. Um, and especially in regards to raw milk and natural cheese making in Canada. Uh, and David is a Canadian, although he spends a lot of time, um, you know, roaming around different parts of the world. And we're going to talk more about um, what he does as well, what he offers um, to the greater global cheese making community. Um, but yeah, the different things we're going to touch on tonight, um, maybe a little bit of natural cheese uh, farming techniques. We're going to talk a little bit about some different breeds and specifically the Vash Canadian cow here in Canada. Uh, we're going to a little bit cover milk treatment. Um, so raw milk versus pasteurization or thermalization. Um, we're going to touch a little bit on microbes and different rennet sources. We've got a really interesting question about that as well. Mm -hmm. And then David's going to talk about um, the Black Sheep School of Cheesemaking, um, which is his, his business. And he's written a, a book, an amazing book, um, and another one on the way. And uh, another book. I don't think there's another baby on the way, but I don't know. <laughs> book baby <laughs> on the way. <laughs> Precisely. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we're going to fill up the next hour in a bit really quickly with all these awesome questions that Kelsey and I have um, come up with. And so Kelsey's going to, we're going to alternate questions. So Kelsey's going to ask the first one and then we'll go from there. So without further ado, go for it, Kelsey. Thank you. So David, big thank you for joining us. We're uh, honored to have you here today and uh, welcome to our call. Oh, I'm so glad you got the, uh, the, the cheese wheel rolling um, in this uh, collective. Uh, very excited to be a part of the, the, this, this, this gathering and to uh, contribute some ideas, um, get the conversation going about uh, uh, the situation of cheese in Canada. There's lots to talk about, um, and it's great to be able to uh, uh, engage folks uh, through this great medium. Well, that's, that's fantastic. So, David, um, we, I don't know if you know, but you are actually one of the influences that got me into cheese making like over a decade ago um, you were studying uh, permaculture out in Linnea College in uh, on Cortez Island out in BC there and uh, experimenting with some cheese making and that uh, kind of transferred over to me uh, through uh, uh, some family who were was there with you and so I've got you to thank in part for uh, oh, you got, down this road on you got uh, to thank, you, 
you got to thank your brother Brendan for part of that. You know, he, he and I were co-conspirators uh, out of that out of that farm. Uh, we were just you know playing uh, off each other, um, seeing who could outdo one another uh, in terms of crazy fermentations and wild cheeses. Um, <laughs> I feel like I've still I've still uh, got momentum from those early days um, of exploration. Um, that's that's so fantastic. So. Uh, I remember hearing like all kinds of stories about the the cheeses that you were producing back then, just some really funky stuff. Can you tell us a little bit about like what got you started on the path to natural cheese making? Okay, so I I, n- I never really imagined myself to be a, a, a cheesemaker uh, or a farmer growing up. Um, I uh, you know grew up in the city in the suburbs of Toronto, uh, where I am right now, uh, visiting my family uh, uh, and. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's shocking to me to see like the path I've, path I've taken. Um, but when I, uh, when I was young, uh, I was really excited about planting seeds. Um, and uh, every year uh, I grew a garden in my parents' backyard um, and uh, uh, grew vegetables for them uh, and uh, started saving seed and such. And uh, every year I planted a bigger and bigger garden uh, until I realized I should probably be a farmer. Um, and uh, uh, meanwhile, I'd become a, 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 a sewage treatment engineer, something I'm not sure we'll get a chance to talk about in class. Um, but uh, uh, I, I had a sort of falling out uh, with my uh, profession. Um, uh, I was challenged by some of the philosophies uh, behind it and the, the, the lack of conversation in the industry. Um, and uh, I decided to, to run away from it all um, and uh, 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 get into farming full time. Um, and uh, 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 participate in uh, a movement towards uh, 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 towards an environmental ethic that uh, I felt was very important, which is the, the, the organic farming movement. And so I dropped out of school, became an organic farmer. Um, and it was while I was uh, exploring opportunities in organic agriculture um, that I sort of stumbled across natural cheese making. Um, and uh, I practiced natural farming uh, 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 in my uh, uh, in my, uh, my farming practices. I, you know, I saved all the seeds I could um, for my plants. Uh, I produced all my own compost um, from uh, uh, animals that I kept. Uh, I fermented much of my produce uh, in order to preserve it through the winter. Uh, I baked sourdough breads with a natural starter that I kept. I fermented natural wines uh, with spontaneous fermentation. And when I first had access to, to raw milk, um, uh, well, I decided I wanted to preserve it and transform it into a cheese in a similar way. And uh, when I made my first batch of cheese, I sort of invoked similar philosophies that I was practicing in you know, farming and fermentation. Um, and I introduced to my, uh, uh, my uh, raw goat's milk, some kefir culture. And uh, I didn't really uh, realize it at the time, uh, but I sort of uh, was stumbling across these ancient traditions of uh, natural fermentation and cheese making that had by and large been lost uh, across uh, North America and even uh, in many, many cases in, in Europe. Um, and uh, my first cheese turned out extraordinary. I, I mean, I couldn't believe how uh, amazing it was. I didn't expect that um, uh, something that I just sort of uh, made up <laughs> um, uh, would turn out so delicious. Um, uh, and it took me a long time to figure out, of course, why um, I, what I was doing was so significant and so important. Um, uh, uh, I, um, uh, uh, meanwhile, I, I started exploring cheese uh, to a much greater degree uh, with my successes under my belt. I, I got... Uh, 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 um, enticed to try other diverse styles, uh, not just a fresh chev, but more aged cheeses. Um, uh, uh, I started exploring some styles of cheese that I learned about while I was studying engineering out in uh, Montreal, uh, exposed to the, the wonderfully diverse and rich uh, Quebecois cheese scene. Um, so I, I, I started making washed rind cheeses and uh, wrinkly rinded geotrician candidum cheeses. Um, and uh, uh, the, the more I explored these uh, natural techniques in cheese making, the more I started to realize that really just about everything was possible with these natural techniques. And I, I sort of never really ever opened up a package of freeze dried, uh, you know, commercial starter culture in order to make any of my cheeses. Um, I realized from the get go that you know, all styles of cheese that exist today um, uh, uh, were created long before uh, we even had the understanding that microbes were involved in the transformation of milk into cheese. You know, traditional cheesemakers uh, invented uh, every single style that we know and love today, long before Pasteur and his contemporaries discovered uh, the role microorganisms play in milk's uh, fermentation and transformation. And uh, 
uh, our modern sort of understanding uh, of uh, the microbiology of cheese uh, perhaps is, 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 is misleading us from a, tr uh, a, a truth of cheese making that's long been sort of suppressed. Um, and uh, uh, the, the readings of, uh, the writings, excuse me, of Slow Food, of Carlo Petrini and others really influenced me and uh, helped me understand uh, more about the traditions of cheese making. Uh, the writers of, uh, the writer of uh, Wild Fermentation and the Art of Fermentation, uh, Sandor Katz, who some of you may know or read about, uh, uh, influenced my uh, early days of fermentation and cheese making as well. Um, and uh, with, uh, you know, all these influences around me, um, uh, I started to realize that this was like, really the right way to do things. Um, and I started teaching natural techniques uh, at local uh, local uh, schools, at community colleges, at uh, uh, local organic farms that were interested in this sort of thing, farm shares around British Columbia where I was farming. Um, and uh, the more I taught, uh, the more uh, challenging questions students asked that you know forced me to understand the medium much more deeply. And the more research I had to do, the more experimentation I had to do, the more I had to explore these natural ideas in order to be able to engage uh, these questions um, that were so important. And um, uh, students were starting to ask for you know some material that they could take home to 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 read about you know in their own time, something that could guide them through these natural techniques and cheese making. And uh, I couldn't really. Uh, uh, help them um, uh, with that. Uh, there wasn't really a book I felt that I was out there that addressed these natural techniques in cheese. You know, most cheese making guidebooks uh, you may have read uh, all encourage folks to pasteurize their milk and introduce to that pasteurized milk freeze dried starter cultures derived from uh, 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 derived from laboratories raised by microbiologists that are introduced to the milk to return to the milk, the pasteurized milk, the life that's taken away by pasteurization. And even if you know you use raw milk to make your cheese, especially if you use raw milk to make your cheese, uh, you should be using these freeze-dried starter cultures as well to assure a good fermentation. And uh, I couldn't possibly tell my students to, uh, to learn from those books. And so uh, with their encouragement, I, I decided to write my own. Um, and uh, got it published back in uh, 2015 or so. That's uh, the art of natural cheese making, which some of you uh, may have uh, picked up. Um, and uh, Can you see uh, it? if I if I move, I've got, on a, way, I've got yeah. a copy there. Yeah, <laughs> we've all got it handy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, and this is the book. Me. This is the book by that's Sandra book. Katz that um, oh, yeah. David just mentioned as well. Uh, the art of fermentation. It. Yeah, this book. If anybody is is listening and they're like oh this is awesome how do i just get started into fermentation like this this is it this is kind of the gold standard of I industry must, must anybody in cheese go down the whole the rabbit hole of learning fermentation and also pick up david's book he literally wrote the book <laughs> on the art of natural cheese making so that's why we're so excited to have david here thank you okay that was a lot david we're gonna we're gonna Segue back to um, one of your parts that you were just talking about there. You, sure. you mentioned a little bit um, Quebec. Quebec is such an incredible cheese making area in Canada. We all know it. We all yep. love Quebec cheeses. Um, and I think we are all curious about um, some of the cheeses coming out of the province of Quebec. And um, we, when you and I spoke um, before tonight, we talked a little bit about a couple of different producers that you wanted to just sort of quickly touch on that are doing some interesting things. Um, I think it's, we could preface this, this next part of the conversation by saying nobody in Canada on a commercial level is really um, following all of the principles of natural cheese making, right? So uh, yeah, I would, I, would, I would have to agree. They're, they're, as far as I understand, and again, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not completely, I'm not familiar with the techniques that are used by every cheesemaker in, right. in their dairies and in Canada, but from what I understand, uh, there isn't a, a cheesemaker that, uh, that exclusively uses on a commercial level. natural techniques on a commercial level in yeah, the dairy yeah. in Canada. But we do have a couple of producers that we can talk about in Quebec um, that, yes. are, that are doing some interesting things. Um, exactly. One of those was uh, Le Tree Charlevoix. And yeah. I think you wanted to talk a little bit about them because of one of the breeds um, of <laughs> milk that they use. And the other one being Au Grey des Champs, which Au I think Kelsey has a, a, Kelsey has a follow-up question about them. Sure. So yes, um, um, you know, when it comes to natural cheese making, um, uh, I just want to sort of preface this. Um, there's a, a few important principles that should be should be held. 
and that is that you know cheesemakers should strive to working towards strive towards working with a, strive towards working with like a, a, as good a milk as possible milk that's as, as fresh as possible preferably cow warm or animal warm uh, from a, a traditional breed from animals who are out uh, on uh, on pasture when seasonally appropriate that's like very very significant uh, cheesemakers should be striving towards uh, using natural starter cultures towards invoking ferment natural fermentation um, from kefir or clabber or such starter cultures instead of using a freeze dried starter uh, they should be uh, trying to use a, a natural rennet in their in their in their in their in their, in their cheese make um, uh, one derived from the, the stomachs of young animals. Something we'll probably talk about later on in the session. Um, but it's also important. A, a final thing, a fourth a sort of pillar of natural cheese making is that uh, cheese makers uh, should be working with the idea that uh, that the, the, the cheese is a sort of uh, uh, traditionally preserved milk, you know, not necessarily like a, a value added product the way we often see it in the industry today, but it's something that, that milk is sort of meant to transform into that there's a long storied history behind and uh, uh, they should be making cheeses according to the, the sort of traditions of, of cheese. Um, and uh, there are a number of cheesemakers in Canada who sort of uphold a few of those principles and maybe not all at the same time. Um, and uh, some of these really extraordinary cheesemakers are, are in Quebec. Uh, uh, one of them uh, is a dairy farmer who's trying to become a cheesemaker, um, uh, uh, who's working hard to create his own dairy, named Mario Duchesne. Um, and uh, he keeps uh, uh, the original breed of Canadian cows um, called the Canadian, uh, it's a vache uh, Canadian, um, uh, that was the original cow uh, or a descendant of the original cows that were brought over by Samuel de Champlain in uh, 1608 or so. Um, <laughs> Right. No um, and so the cheese that he's making in uh, uh, participation uh, in uh, collaboration with Laiterie Charlevoix um, uh, is a, a cheese that's being uh, cheese called 1608 that's being produced with his uh, milk from the Vache Canadienne. Um, and it's a, this beautiful sort of raclette style, semi-firm, wash drying cheese. It's very, uh, uh, very intensely flavorful um, and uh, 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 is made with, uh, as far as I understand, uh, I'm not sure, uh, uh, low temperature processed at least milk. It's, I don't know if it's raw specifically or if it's thermized, thermized. Uh, I can't say, yeah. um, but close, right? Um, and yeah. uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a delightful cheese and one that's available fortunately in, uh, for uh, cheese eaters, I think across the country um, to consume. I've, had, I've, had, I've tasted it outside of the province, so you can, you can get a taste of it yourself. And um, working with his traditional breed, uh, uh, it is really um, uh, something significant. It really uh, uh, helps to define this, this style as something distinctly uh, uh, Canadian. So it's, uh, it's definitely important, um, as opposed to using improved breeds um, uh, that, uh, uh, that give considerably greater yield per animal um, instead of producing cheese with the same, uh, same Holstein uh, uh, race that's used by cheesemakers across the province. Uh, this cheesemaker has decided to do something different, to go a little bit rogue um, and to uh, define uh, the characteristic of this cheese as being you know, made from uh, these uh, historical and beautiful animals that need to be preserved uh, or will be sort of lost forever. Um, and there's something significant about this history and uh, needs to be valued. And eating this cheese uh, really helps uh, support this mission of Mario Duchesne, um, who uh, is, a, is a good friend. That's right. Um, there, and there are yeah. some other cheeses made with the milk. There's the Hercule de Charlevoix um, and Origine de Charlevoix under the Laitry Charlevoix. Yes. And then uh, Fromagerie Pien de Bon as well. Uh, oh, they, may, they have Ashkenazian out there too. Right, exactly. Yes. Okay, great. They're in the um, they're in the, the Mag, they're in the Magdalen Islands, a magnificent place to visit. If anyone's ever, I don't know if anyone's ever been out there. It's, yeah, I know Kelsey has been there. there. Yeah, yeah, Kelsey's been there as well. I have yet to make it there, but and and their okay. cheese, their cheese, the Pied de Vent was one that really I think first sort of gave me a taste of something different, like something that I, I did not grow up with, um, something I was exposed to in my in my my school days in, in Montreal that got me thinking a little bit about. Uh, 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 differences. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So Kelsey, you got a, the next question lined up for us? Yeah, absolutely. Just touching on the, the Vash Canadian for a second. Uh, mm -hmm. When we think of Europe, we think of, you know, a lot of traditional breeds that are like native to the region where those cheeses are still made, whether well, it's like Simmental cows or specific breeds of uh, like goats and sheep and yeah. Um, do you see like the Vash Canadian as kind of like a, a Canadian equivalent? So, I, I mean, I suppose so, although, although you should really, ex we should really exemplify 
and uh, and, and and show that it's like it's Quebecois. You know, uh, I like to emphasize that it is something specific from the, the Quebecois region. Although there are some uh, fantastic cheesemakers, maybe under the radar <laughs> cheesemakers in Ontario, uh, who keep the the vache canadien as a sort of small scale farmstead uh, uh, dairying and cheesemaking. Um, but um, I, 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 you know, for, in terms of Canadian, um, you know, interestingly, in my travels teaching cheese around the world, it's quite common that I actually come across Canadian cows um, uh, <laughs> from like embryos uh, and semen delivered, you know, frozen from Semex, uh, like one of the largest distributors of, uh, 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 of uh, Canadian uh, bovine genetics uh, all around the world. Um, so to me, that's kind of the, the sort of you know, current situation. And when it comes to Canadian uh, uh, cheese, is that like the, the Canadian influence in like genetics and dairying worldwide is, is pretty significant. Um, and I, 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 don't, I, I can't really speak to the existence of any like distinctly Canadian um, uh, uh, traditions or practices in like breeds other than the, the Alaska idea. Yeah, cool. Now, uh... I know uh, one of the other cheese companies that you and Aaron were chatting about uh, is one that really stands out to me. Uh, yes. A number of years ago, I was traveling around Quebec and mm -hmm. Great Deschamps, just like yeah. every single bite is just so unique. And, Everything they do, uh, it's just out of this out of this world. Absolutely. Um, what is it that really stands out to you about their cheese making? So uh, there's, a, there's a number of things. Um, and first of all, it's a, it's a phenomenal uh, family operation, uh, many generations of, uh, of dairying uh, under their belt, uh, and have I think they transitioned to farmstead cheesemaking uh, in this past generation or so, um, uh, and the, the, the parents are passing on the torch to the next generation of young uh, of the family, um, and um, uh, they uh, produce all their own milk. Uh, I believe it's from Brown Swiss, although again, don't quote me on that, um, uh, in their farm, um, and um, one of the things that's really significant about what they do is that um, uh, they work, I think, almost exclusively with uh, warm milk from their animals. Um, and so they're able to, you know, just set up the pipeline from their farm directly into their, their cheesemaking, from their animals directly into their cheesemaking vat. Um, and there's not many uh, farmers or cheesemakers in Canada who realize the significance of that. Uh, you know, this is uh, one of the, you know, I believe, one of the most important principles uh, behind the, the extraordinary quality of, of a cheese that comes out of Europe is that cheesemakers there understand that milk is, you know, degrades quite rapidly when it's uh, submitted to refrigeration, um, uh, that milk fats oxidize and rancidify, and that the microbial ecology of the, the milk, raw milk, is, uh, is significantly uh, 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 distorted by refrigeration. But they take that milk still warm from the animal and sort of introduce starter cultures and run it to it uh, immediately while it's at the you know, perfect temperature for cheese making, which is sort of body temperature. Um, and uh, the cheese that comes about from such a, a, a wise choice uh, in cheese making, and it is sort of a, a choice of cheese maker, of the cheese maker that, to do that, um, uh, is just extraordinary on all levels. And there's almost nothing you can sort of <laughs> do wrong uh, when you're working with, with milk like that. I mean, of course you do have to have skill as a cheesemaker, there's no doubt about that, but almost anything you do with that milk is just gonna take the cheese to an extraordinary level uh, and it's gonna uh, 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 exemplify the flavors of any particular style. It's like every style is best, every style of cheese is best made with milk uh, that's sort of cow warm or goat warm or sheep warm. And the best cheeses in the world, including those from, you know, au gré de champ, they're, they're up there in my mind, um, are made with milk of you know such a caliber. Um, you know, Roquefort cheese is made uh, uh, by, in, in some cases, by cheesemakers who receive the milk still warm from the animals into their cheesemaking vats and just add rennet and starter cultures to that. You know, sheep warm milk. Uh, Comté and other uh, famous Alpine cheeses in France are made, you know, with milk that's delivered to the, the dairies, the fruiteries, still warm uh, from the animals. But it's something that's very rare to find in cheesemaking operations in uh, in North America. There's very few cheesemakers who work with animal warm milk. Uh, it means a sort of different approach to cheesemaking. It means a, a different responsibility. It means making cheese often twice a day um, mm -hmm. in order to actually work with that warm milk. Um, and that's something few cheesemakers can realize. Most cheesemakers set up their dairy to work with milk that's been sitting around for 48 hours in their bulk milk tanks. Um, but the sort of cheese that you end up getting when you work with milk like that ends up sort of falling into a, a category, unfortunately, uh, that I, I would classify as sort of industrial cheese, is that something as significant as lost. And uh, it may not even be safe uh, to work with uh, raw milk that's been uh, kept under refrigeration for 48 hours. There may actually be a significant microbiological risk um, uh, in association with that. You know, it's not just a, 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 a character flaws in the cheese that results, you can actually get salmonella, listeria, E. coli growing in milk that's 
raw milk, especially that's uh, refrigerated for a long time. You know, long-term refrigeration is essentially one of the big reasons why pasteurization uh, is so commonplace in North America is that pasteurization enables milk to be mishandled like that um, without causing any significant uh, food risk, um, significant risk to human health. But if you're working with raw milk still warm from the udder, something extraordinary can evolve from that. It's both like you know, on a flavor level, but also on a, on a health level. It's like extraordinary food and every morsel of their cheese really attests to that. It's just unbelievable. And uh, uh, they also make some really uh, uh, rare things too. Um, so they're one of maybe just two cheesemakers in North America, maybe three, I'm not sure the exact number, that makes a raw milk cheese aged less than 60 days. Um, Quebec has a special status. Uh, they argued uh, for the right, the cultural right to produce raw milk cheeses aged less than 60 days. Uh, you know, traditional French cheeses like camembert, and goat's cheeses that can't be aged 60 days, made, if they're made with raw milk, that can't be eaten after that date because they've gone, you know, off the, they've, 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 they've flown off, sorry, they've, they've, uh, they've spoiled, they've like you know, flowed off the shelf. Um, uh, 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 Cheesemakers there have fought for their right to produce these traditional cheeses made with fresh raw milk, and they're one of the, uh, uh, three cheesemakers, I think, in the province that uh, is going through the steps in order to produce these uh, fresh raw milk cheeses. And then they make a, this beautiful cheese called Pont Blanc, um, which is a little hard to get. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, it is a raw milk, uh, lactic style, uh, uh, like a uh, crottin style, I suppose, wrinkly rinded cheese. It's just out of this world. Um, and it's one of just you know, a handful of raw milk cheeses that's aged less than 60 days. And it's worth seeking out, and worth a trip to Quebec for, I think. Exactly. Summer road trips. This could be a, a place that uh, if anybody is looking to visit Quebec for a summer vacation, maybe you put that one on the map. Because uh, I think that they're, yeah, they're doing some special stuff and, and definitely a place to learn more about. Mm -hmm. Was that, Kelsey, did you get your full question out there? Um, you know, yeah. we can come back to the part two later, because okay. I think it's a lot. A lot more to discuss. Yeah. Um, just very quickly, one other thing that I really love about uh, Au Grey des Champs is that uh, they plant um, specific wildflowers um, that they want to highlight in in their milk, and it, they're trying to recreate, um, you know, like the wild pasture of like the Alps and different European regions where they don't have monocrops, but uh, a variety of uh, grasses and flowers for their cows to uh, pasture on. So, you know, going back to David, while you're chatting about, about the beginning, like natural cheese making isn't just about cheese making, it really starts on the farm. It does indeed. It's, it's definitely agricultural. There's no question. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, you know, anyway, go ahead. No, you go ahead. It's good. So I just wanted to maybe make a quick shout out to some other cheesemakers who are invoking sort of natural ideas quickly. Yeah. Um, so um, out in Manitoba, uh, there's a new cheese called, new but also very old cheese called Prairie Tradition. You may have heard about uh, made by D Dustin Peltier. Who's um, on the call right uh, now. He's on the call right now, great. Hi yeah. there, Dustin. So uh, <laughs> he should be the next speaker. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, 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 he um, is making a, the traditional original Oka, you might say. I don't know if I'm allowed to use that word. Um, uh, <laughs> I believe, I don't know if he's currently using raw milk. He can update you guys in the chat. Um, uh, 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 but I don't know if he's using traditional starter culture still. Although that was the original recipe. Um, but it's a beautiful wash drawing monastic style that he's making in aging um, um, in, uh, in Manitoba. And it's, uh, it's yeah. out of this world. Um, and uh, out in uh, uh, British Columbia, there's a Kootenai Alpine cheesemaking company who you know, makes their traditional uh, mountain, Swiss mountain cheeses in copper kettles, I believe imported from, from Europe. And uh, those cheeses are a taste of the old country, uh, made, I believe, with raw milk as well. So they're, they're pretty, pretty well, uh, both styles of cheese are both worth, see worth seeking out, but I think they're hard to get outside of their provinces of origin. Yeah. We've also got uh, another one from Quebec that's a little bit hard to get as well. Etienne, my colleague at um, Au Terroir, mentioned uh, Fromagerie de Grandine makes a, a cheese called Festin, which is also aged less than 30 days. Um, and again, made in Quebec, raw milk yes. and it's delicious. Um, like Grandine, do you know Grandine, uh, David? No, I haven't. I haven't met them yet. There's, there's Not another time in Quebec. interesting one for, for your, um, to follow up on mm -hmm. note list. I'm sure you've got lots. 
Um, so next question kind of falls into uh, something that was mentioned a little bit earlier. We're going to move on to talking a little bit about some European cheeses that people on the call might um, know about that, that fall into those pillars of what is cheese, uh, natural cheese making. So the question is, cheese is made around the world using natural traditional methods. Can you tell us a bit about some of the cheeses we may know internationally that use natural cheese making methods still today? Sure. Although I should say, I started off with a, a, a note is that many of these, you know, many of these cheeses are still, you know, made according to traditional technologies uh, that have been brought into the modern world um, without very, with, you know, with very little change, um, very little adaptation, um, and are still made according to their original traditional techniques. But the, the makers who produce them don't often identify, necessarily identify them as natural. Um, so I, I don't want to sort of take ownership or any responsibility for, you know, cheeses made this way. But uh, there's a comparison, important comparison to be made, and that is that you know many of the original styles of cheese made in Europe are produced with traditional methods, and these are uh, important philosophies to uphold. They are the, one of the main reasons why these cheeses remain so so uh, uh, so significant, and why they've uh, lasted to this day is that they're you know they continue to be made with these original techniques, and that's one of the things that makes them so extraordinary, that makes them so sought out. And there are a number of cheeses today that have sort of continue to uphold their you know, traditional techniques uh, that are still made with natural techniques. And I'll, I'll talk about a few of them. Uh, some of them you, you may be very familiar with. Uh, 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 Parmigiano Reggiano, for example, is uh, uh, one of the most famous cheeses. It's still made with a whey starter culture uh, that's saved from day to day. It is the responsibility of Parmigiano Reggiano producers to keep a whey starter culture. It's a requirement in order for them to produce their cheeses. And they cannot use freeze dried starter cultures. It's understood that that would uh, not bring out the fullest flavor of these styles of cheese. And uh, if a cheesemaker has a problem with their, you know, whey starter culture failing, uh, uh, it's okay. It's not a significant problem because they can knock on their neighbor's door. They can knock on the, another Casavicio uh, Parmigiano uh, door and uh, ask to borrow some of their uh, way starter culture. And the uh, cheesemaker there will understand that it's a part of sort of a sort of collective responsibility to share this culture. That it's not something that's like distinctly uniquely theirs, but something that's a part of this collective that makes mm -hmm. you know the whole consortium's production of cheese really special and really distinct. So that's, that's one cool. great example. You know I most. Wonder I wonder if anybody has ever studied um, from one producer to the next, the, you know, the, what, what's going on in that bacterial culture? Like, is it basically the same? I'm exactly. sure it's been studied, but it's all in Italian. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, Italy has a, an extraordinary tradition of natural cheesemaking. Mm -hmm. um, when the rest of the world, uh, rest of Europe and North America, uh, modernized their dairies when you know when they you know made things clean in the late 1800s as like it was understood that germs uh microorganisms from the environment were causing uh, defects in cheese uh problems in cheese uh, uh, uh northern europeans sort of switched their cheese making from a sort of wild fermentation approach um, uh, which was no longer possible because they weren't using wooden vats uh, they switched to a more modern controlled approach in which they used freeze-dried starter cultures that originated in largely in denmark and that were uh, propagated and used by cheesemakers all around the world. Uh, but in, in Italy, they never sort of adopted this modern microbiological approach to making cheese. They uh, 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 had faith in the traditional fermentation of their cheeses and they, they saved whey from day to day um, and uh, have continued this practice until today. And most really good Italian cheeses are made with a whey starter culture. And it's, it's codified in their, 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 their uh, 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 PDOs or DOPs uh, in, uh, in, their, in, their, in their country. Uh, so, uh, 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 excuse me, um, uh, mozzarella di bufala needs to be made with a traditional way starter culture. Cacio cavallos need to be made with a way starter culture. Uh, ragusanos and many, many, many Ragusano. more um, have you're, to be made with a traditional starter culture safe from batch to batch. Your, uh, your good friend Trevor, who was in <laughs> Italy a couple months ago, maybe, or maybe even just a month ago, uh, showed the most fascinating look at um, how ragusano is made. And I just was like, you know, glued to my my phone screen watching where he was. It was so fascinating yeah. to see how they make the, the shape and everything. Just a question, how do they, what is the actual technique of um, using and, and protecting that whey culture? So um, it's very easy. Um, uh, uh, um, um, when you're doing this every day, um, you simply save whey at the end of the day's make. Uh, you take a you know a, a liter of, uh, of whey from the, the top of the vat uh, uh, before the make is done. You save some of that. You put it aside in the dairy. Uh, some cheesemakers put it in a warm place. Some cheesemakers put it in a in a cooler place. It depends on what they're looking for. Um, they leave it to ferment overnight. 
And then the following morning, the whey has acidified and become uh, you know, a rich source of beneficial lactose fermenting microorganisms and other uh, beneficial uh, 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 milk fermenting species um, uh, that can be added to the milk. Um, that will introduce all the starter culture that any cheesemaker would ever need for just about any style of cheese. It's, it's all there. And That's uh, so cool. if the cheesemaker is doing that every day, uh, believe it or not, this way starter culture sort of propagates itself. The culture feeds itself every day just on the, you know, the, the milk sugars and such. Uh, it's all that culture needs to get going. And uh, as long as the cheesemakers practice you know, very careful uh, techniques in this regard, using the freshest milk possible uh, and being very careful about saving the, the culture every single day, uh, the fermentation that comes about will be remarkably true. Sort of just like a, a sourdough starter culture. You know? mm -hmm. She's, a, a bread baker can rely entirely upon their sourdough starter culture to raise their breads. You know, they can, without a doubt, uh, make their breads uh, uh, day after day and be sure they're going to rise without you know, having to analyze it microbiolo microbiologically just by sort of observing its transformation from day to day. And a traditional cheesemaker uh, working with a back slopped way can do it the exact same manner. And of course, you know, a natural bread baker would never ever consider baking their bread without adding a starter culture, like you never ever bake bread without adding that sourdough culture, the bread wouldn't ferment properly. And the same is sort of true with a, a, a naturally made cheese. A natural cheesemaker would never ever consider, should never ever consider making cheese without adding that ferment. Um, things, don't, things don't go well when you leave milk to spontaneously do its own thing. I, I don't recommend it. So natural cheese is the sourdough of, yes. of the bread bakers. Yeah. I, I, would, I would say just about everything that kind of applies to sourdough applies to uh, the natural uh, fermentation of dairy. Yeah, um, they're almost they're almost you know they're almost the same. Cool, that's um, great. And it may may well be. I mean, this is a this is um, beyond what we're going to talk about today. But it may well be that the microorganisms that cause a bread to rise, the yeast species that cause the bread to rise, are the same microorganisms that uh, enable some cheeses to develop their most spectacular and beautiful rinds. Ah. These are lactic acid fermenting microorganisms that exist both in uh, sourdough starter cultures as well as you know sour milk ferment. If anybody on the call finds that information right there particularly interesting, I invite you to purchase David's book and also The Art of Fermentation <laughs> and get, get reading. It's super interesting when you start to connect the dots through all different kinds of fermentation. And this is, this is doable anywhere. You know, you don't have to be in Italy in order to save way from day to day, in order to have success with your cheese making. Cheesemakers anywhere in the world can save uh, their beneficial microorganisms from their own milk in order to have success with their cheese making. Um, but we tend to think we don't, we don't have the right microorganisms uh, in other parts of the world. We tend to think that here in Canada, oh, we don't have the right microbes. Our milk is either too clean or too dirty, um, or it, it doesn't have the right appropriate species. But you know, where did, you know, these microorganisms are part of like the cows, beneficial microbial ecology. They're a part of the extraordinary fermentation that happens inside the, the animals of, uh, sorry, inside the bodies of cows and their calves when they drink their mother's milk. Um, and these microorganisms are part of this extraordinary uh, uh, system, this biological system that has traveled all around the world. You know, that the cows that we have in, in, in Canada are really not all that different than the cows in France or Italy. And they, they carried with them, uh, you know, in 1608, uh, those beneficial microorganisms from France that enable the milk to ferment uh, inside the guts of young calves that drink their mother's milk that also, you know, by the way, help milk transform into cheese inside the cheese vat. You know, this is all a part of the, the, the biology of milk, something that's, you know, come to light in the, the last 10 years as we've begun to explore the, the microbiome, human microbiome and mm -hmm. bovine microbiome cheese microbiome. Uh, it seems to be that these uh, beneficial microorganisms are everywhere. And so long as we create the right conditions uh, for them to express themselves, these microorganisms can be summoned from good raw milk just about anywhere in the world. And cheesemakers can make cheeses of the, the most exceptional quality of like the truest taste with their own microorganisms from the milk anywhere, uh, not just in Quebec, you know, in, uh, the, Ang the, the English side of Canada as well, uh, anywhere uh, is possible. I think Kelsey has like the perfect follow-up question ready yeah, to go so for you. Speaking of microbes, mm. David, Aaron mentioned that uh, you might be able to do a demonstration for us today. Oh, so uh, yeah. Maybe. So uh, I guess I'm doing one right now. <laughs> this is, a, this is a, a natural cider that I, I prepared last year that I've been aging uh, over the winter um, here at my in-laws in, in Toronto. Um, 
I just returned uh, uh, this week after a, a month's away and uh, my uh, cider has fermented beautifully. And it's a cider that's prepared with a natural starter culture with a bit of back slop, a bit of fermentation from a previous batch that allowed the fermentation to take off and uh, keeps unwanted species from developing and allows the fermentation to go in its best possible way. Um, you know, this is um, uh, a traditional fermentation, uh, much in line with sort of like Basque cider making or French cider making traditions that of course can be carried out anywhere in the world. Um, and the way in which I prepared this cider is very much uh, in line with the way you might keep a sourdough starter culture or the way you might keep a, a traditional milk fermenting culture. And so that's what I, I'll show you now. Um, so here I have in another cup, um, my uh, sour milk, um, my um, clabber as you might call it, um, uh, my... Uh, uh, what is a clabber? Can you tell so us? Let, me, let me just try to describe that. So it, it's not exactly an English word. It's a, uh, it's Gaelic. It's Irish. It, it's a, it's a tradition of fermenting milk that came came to North America from the Isles. Um, in other countries in the world, it's known as uh, uh, dick milk. That's what they call it in Germany. It means thick milk. Uh, in uh, Ukraine, they call it prostokvasha. Uh, just about, uh, and in uh, in Africa, some parts of Africa, they call it amasi. Um, uh, in, in Iran, it's Iran. Um, and this is a, a sort of uh, thickened milk that makes itself uh, with the help of milk's own indigenous microorganisms that are meant to ferment that milk. Um, and uh, if you take raw milk, uh, preferably uh, right from the animals, still warm, it, it makes a difference. Uh, although it's okay if that raw milk's been refrigerated up to 24 hours, that's my personal limit. Um, if you take that fresh raw milk and leave it in a warm place, something we're inclined not to do, of course, something we've been, uh, I might say brainwashed, uh, 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 against doing, um, you know, we're, we're told that milk needs to be refrigerated. Um, uh, in fact, refrigeration may actually be damaging to uh, milk's own microbial ecology and may cause the milk to uh, be dangerous to consume. Um, uh, uh, pasteurized milk needs to be kept refrigerated. Uh, does not have a protective uh, a halo of microorganisms that allows it to ferment in a beneficial way. It will spoil if it's left out at room temperature, but raw milk perhaps should be left at room temperature instead of being refrigerated. It is the best thing for the microbial ecology of the milk. It's the best thing for its preservation and maybe even for its consumption. And if you take that raw milk and uh, leave it out at room temperature for two to three days, it will ferment spontaneously with its own uh, beneficial microorganisms. Mm. Uh, there may be some bad players that en end up in the mix. Um, you know, raw milk isn't just a, you know, a fountain of beneficial microorganisms. There are some uh, uh, unwanted pathogens that could pop up. There could be coliforms, uh, listeria and such in that, that milk supply. So you, you know, the first fermentation that happens may not be so uh, extraordinary. Um, uh, modern dairy farms as well uh, practice very sanitary uh, uh, procedures in their milking. And so the beneficial the populations of beneficial microorganisms in milk are actually fairly low. They've been sort of sanitized by the uh, pre-dips and post-dips and sanitization of the milking lines and such and you know such industrially produced milk doesn't necessarily ferment well on its own and may actually take longer to ferment giving these unwanted species a, a chance to a grow faster. Pre-dips pre uh, and post-dips are of the udders right? That's right iodine. Dipping, dipping the udders in iodine solution yeah which yeah which essentially off. halts fermentation of Any that milk. Kind it helps of... with natural process uh, yeah. that's a part of the milk. So it's like that fine line of animal husbandry that gets that that's really clean and provides yeah. like the ultimate um, environment for all the good bacteria to grow without it being overwhelmingly bad bacteria, right? Yeah. Someone someone once said to me, uh, someone uh, when I was giving a cheese making workshop in, in Belgium, they said to me, uh, 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 "Cleanliness is the mother of cheese making," and to her I responded, "Well." Filthiness is the father of cheese making. You need there, some there, of both, right? There needs you need to that. Be some filth. A little there bit of harmony some, there. So in some sort of balance. Mm -hmm. and you can actually do all this with you know milk, standard milk from an industrial dairy, believe it or not. Um, but you need to introduce this sort of uh, element of contamination, good contamination of beneficial microorganisms that can uh, add back to that milk these microorganisms that are taken away by standard dairying practices. And mm -hmm. this sort of milk that ferments itself will eventually become a source of these good microorganisms. So you can you know, take this fermented milk, the first batch is not so good, you know, two to three days after it ferments, it may be a little bitter, there may be gas development. It's, it's not always this delicious sour yogurt that it could be. Um, 
But if there's more traditional dairying practices, more likely it will ferment well. For example, when I get raw milk in Latin America, where folks don't practice the same sort of standard of, of hygiene in their, in their, in their dairying, uh, the milk that I typically get that's often milked in wooden buckets or plastic pails that are kind of never washed out actually ferments a lot better, a lot faster and a lot more reliably than uh, uh, milk from North American dairies. And I can almost rely upon that milk to ferment itself, um, although I, I wouldn't necessarily advise that. <laughs> Um, but nevertheless, you know, this raw milk left out to ferment itself, itself uh, regardless of its original quality, will develop this sort of lactic fermentation with you know, various lactics, acid, sorry, lactose fermenting species present in raw milk. They will grow in number um, and uh, uh, they will cause that milk to eventually acidify as the lactose turns to lactic acid. But once you've got this milk fermented, you can then um, improve that fermentation. Uh, select for these beneficial fermenting microorganisms through backslop, which is a word I've been throwing around. Uh, mm -hmm. It means saving a little bit from batch to batch. It's what you do when you make yogurt, uh, when you make sourdough bread, when you make natural uh, wine in the best way. You save a little bit from a previous batch to use as a starter culture for the next. And if you just take a little scoop of the starter culture out and put it in a jar and feed it some more, you know, preferably fresh raw milk, um, um, preferably cow warm, uh, yeah. the fermentation, the second fermentation gets going a lot faster because you've planted the seed. So you're, and, uh, you're feeding your starter. Exactly. You're feeding you're, the starter instead of with a sourdough bread with some more flour, you're feeding you it. it with some fresh raw milk. You got it. It's all and the this, same. And this really gets these, you know, this second fermentation is when things really get going. Uh, uh, and uh, the, even though there might be some unwanted microorganisms in that first spoon of backslop, the beneficial milk fermenting microorganisms out to compete them. Yeah. They are made for milk or milk may be made for them. It's hard to really know, um, mm -hmm. but the studies are showing that these two things are sort of milk and microbes are interrelated in these extraordinary ways. Um, and uh, uh, these uh, microorganisms feed on the milk, transform that milk sugars into lactic acid and other secondary metabolites that effectively control the growth of these unwanted microorganisms like salmonella, listeria, E. coli, and others don't stand a chance when this milk is properly fermented. And the second ferment, that turns out extraordinarily well. It often ferments within 12 hours at you know 20 degrees Celsius. And cool. the more often this is done, the more that culture is purified and the stronger it gets and the better it becomes as a starter culture. And within within five days of feeding the culture every day, you know, a cheesemaker can create from their own raw milk, the starter culture that they can use sustainably for their cheesemaking for the rest of their days. Then they can pass that culture on to their, you know, their grandkids and pass that culture on to theirs. Much the same way that these traditional starter cultures are passed down from generation to generation in Europe. And much the same way that a sourdough starter culture is passed down or kefir grains are passed down from generation yeah. to generation. Speaking of kefir grains, David, I know you're a big advocate of using kefir grains. What are they and how do you use them in cheesemaking? Um, so um, kefir grains um, are uh, an extraordinary source of beneficial microorganisms um, for uh, the household or the farmstead cheesemaker. Um, they are a traditional culture from uh, the, somewhere between the Caucasus Mountains in Asia and uh, Mongolia. Uh, traditional culture ferments milk and in the process forms these grains, these, these weird granules, globules um, that have this strange sort of mushroomy gelatinous texture um, that essentially carry the culture forward from batch to batch. And uh, people who uh, make kefir uh, put the kefir grains into milk, the milk ferments, sorry, the kefir grains ferment the milk into kefir. And then the kefir grains are strained out and put into a, a fresh batch of milk. And those kefir grains uh, uh, ferment that next batch of milk into more kefir. And these kefir grains can be strained out of milk again and again, uh, preparing kefir day after day after day um, uh, as part of a, you know, a, a tradition of fermentation that's gone back maybe eight or 9,000 years. Uh, this kefir culture, nobody knows exactly where it came from or uh, how it was created. Um, there's sort of scant archeological evidence about its history, but it's kind of understood that there's this long story um, of people keeping it that goes back to perhaps the early days of uh, animal husbandry, you know, from the first animals that may have been milked. Uh, it may well be that kefir grains formed as a result of the natural fermentation that people started practicing with their milk in order to preserve it and uh, transform it into a, a delicious food. Um, and it, it, uh, it, uh, nobody knows again exactly how kefir was first created or where it first came from, um, but this kefir culture has sort of made its way all around the world and is used by uh, traditional fermenters of dairy products um, in all sorts of unlikely places. 
you know, my, in my travels, I've encountered kefir grains in um, Mexico, in Chile, in the Netherlands, uh, across, uh, all across Europe uh, and, uh, and Asia. Um, and it seems as though they have a long history of fermenting milk in a way that may you know, have been forgotten about. Um, it may well be that um, this was something that was much more significant around the world um, uh, historically, but something that may have been lost in the modern era uh, due to, you know, like uh, changing circumstances on farms, uh, modernization of agriculture and such, and maybe that this culture was lost. Um, but uh, the culture still exists in many places in the world. And, you know, in uh, the 1960s and 1970s in North America, we started adopting it. It became something that was quite uh, common to keep in the uh, hippie granola uh, crowd. <laughs> I include myself in that. Um, in our modern sort of uh, awareness of probiotics, it's become recognized as being a very significant source, perhaps the best source of beneficial microorganisms for the gut um, uh, uh, and provides a whole host of other uh, beneficial uh, uh, results uh, to the human health as well. Um, and uh, from a cheesemaking perspective, uh, it turns out that this uh, culture of kefir uh, may be one of the most extraordinary and diverse sources of beneficial microorganisms for uh, 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 diverse styles of cheese. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not common for kefir grains to be used as a starter culture for cheese. Uh, 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 folks don't really talk about it, um, uh, but it's something that I really strongly advocate, strongly advocate for because um, it is a uh, culture that's accessible to anyone anywhere in the world, uh, even if they don't have access to raw milk, you know, like here in Canada, where the sale of raw milk is illegal and where the microorganisms of raw milk are considered suspect, uh, mm -hmm. using a, a culture like kefir to initiate a, a fermentation in cheese is actually a very safe and effective and recognized method um, of uh, transforming milk into cheese that could be easily practiced uh, on just about any scale um, in any dairy. Um, and it's very, very effective and very sustainable. And the culture has been around for thousands of years and you don't have to worry about being contaminated and it reproduces true day after day, so long as it's kept uh, you know, the same way um, and can serve as a starter culture for making a wide variety of different cheeses. You know, geotrician candidum ripen lactic cheeses grow geotrician candidum on their rinds with the help of geotrician candidum, which is a, a microorganism that's native to kefir culture as well. And if you'll see wrinkly rinds growing on the top of a kefir culture that's left neglected on the counter for a week. And that's one of the things that clued me into the idea that you could use a kefir starter culture as a source of these beneficial uh, rind ripening microorganisms. And we happen to have somebody um, local here in Ontario, uh, maybe not as widely known about. Um, their cheeses are, are mostly sold off the farm and maybe at mm -hmm. a lot of markets, um, I believe at this point, but that's Secret Lands, yes. uh, who Secret are a sheep milk producer. A sheep well. cheese maker up, out in Grey Highlands, uh, the center of Southern Ontario, uh, yeah. use uh, their Russian cheese makers um, who've been in Canada for uh, making cheese for uh, seven years. I think they started out the first year that I uh, published my book and we met each other at the farmer's market and uh, 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 had a, a wonderful uh, uh, a wonderful time with each other talk uh, you know just playing around with kefir because she was already using kefir in her dairy making uh, uh, fer fermented milk for her eastern european clientele um, something that's you know it's a food that's consumed all across eastern europe uh, it has a long history in uh, russian uh, uh, russian speaking parts of the world uh, and uh, their neighbors um, and uh, 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 she's using it to make uh, a very delicious sheep milk kefir, as well as a few other traditional uh, Eastern European dairy products and uh, without having to use freeze dried starter cultures. And it's, it's not just them that are using uh, a kefir as a starter culture in cheese. Um, uh, Liberté, um, uh, one of the, the larger uh, dairy uh, processors in Quebec produces a line of different yogurts and other fermented dairy products. I don't think they necessarily make cheese, so we don't tend to include them in these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they uh, prepare uh, a number of different kefirs, most, many of which are actually uh, not really real kefir. They're made with freeze-dried starter cultures, the same way most cheeses are, um, with packaged starter cultures that sort of represent the kefir grain but aren't the same thing. But um, they still make to this day, uh, an original kefir, it's a little harder to find, that's made with a true kefir grain. And you have to really look hard for it. You have to ask around. I think it's harder to find outside of Quebec, but it's a, it's a different kind of kefir. It's not normal kefir that sits on the shelf that just sits on the shelf and nothing happens to it. This kefir ferments, <laughs> it's alive, and it, it, it carbonates itself as it sits on the shelf in the store. And, like the lid of the container sort of 
rises, <laughs> often bursts, explodes in the store. And when you, when you buy this package of, of kefir, it actually has a, a warning on the, on, the, on the package that says, don't worry, this is a perfectly normal thing for this container to explode. It's part of this champagne effect, this natural fermentation of you know, carbon dioxide. To, they don't say it on the bottle. <laughs> Sorry, they don't, they don't say it on the bottle, but it's a, you know, a natural fermentation of lactic acid to alcohol that's happening within this dairy product that causes this extraordinary fermentation to happen. Um, and I got my first taste, I suppose, of natural cheese making from consuming this when I used to live in Quebec. I got addicted to this stuff. Of course, I understand why uh, these days, you know, it is uh, mildly alcoholic. It probably has <laughs> one to 2% <laughs> alcohol in it uh, from this advanced fermentation, but also it has a, an extraordinary microbiological profile full of the best probiotics that actually, you know, improve the quality of your uh, microbiome, uh, and the microbiome is, is understood now to regulate all sorts of important functions in our bodies, including like uh, this important quality uh, in the, like the mind gut connection that improves uh, mental well being. Um, and the origin of the term kefir is uh, uh, to feel good. It's, it's Turkish. Uh, I think I'm pronouncing it wrong. It's actually like kefir. It's not kefir, kefir. Um, but uh, uh, it's been drunk for a long time for its uh, a wonderful, soothing, uh, therapeutic effects. And uh, it's great for agriculture too. I'm sure there's another hour about QPR. <laughs> oh, at least. Keep going. Um, yeah. But I think it's important that we, you've, you know, you've done a really great little introduction to what is natural cheese making and natural starter cultures. Um, but you've also mentioned freeze-dried cultures a few times. And I think it's mm -hmm. important for us to like, acknowledge what that is and, and what place that plays in modern cheese making, especially in Canada. And, and then we have a couple more questions. We're at, uh, we're at eight o'clock okay. and so we have about 20 minutes left and four questions just so you, so you know where we're at. So right. what happens when we use freeze dried starters and how does this affect the natural properties of the milk? Okay. So, um, Freeze dried starter cultures are you know, an established and acceptable way of uh, fermenting milk, transforming it into, into cheese. And uh, most cheesemakers uh, in North America utilize them. Um, it's very rare uh, to find a cheesemaker who goes without them. It's sort of this understood as the established practice. This is the way you make cheese. You buy these starter cultures from companies like Danisco, which is yeah. a subsidiary of uh, Dow DuPont. Uh, or a Christian Hansen, uh, based out of uh, Denmark, which manufactures uh, uh, one uh, manufactures ingredients used in like one out of every two cheeses made worldwide. <laughs> um, wow! So um, uh, there's like an extraordinary amount of consolidation in this industry, which is just you know disconcerting. Of course, these cultures have to come in from afar; they're not produced. Uh, uh, in, in indigenously, they're not produced on, on you know American or Canadian soil. That have to be imported. Um, there's various problems uh, around that. You know, it did, didn't happen uh, uh, during COVID times, but it could well have happened that there would have been a supply uh, chain disruption in these essential starter cultures that would have prevented uh, cheesemakers from uh, 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 successfully fermenting their milk. And I have actually spoken to some cheesemakers internationally who found themselves in that circumstance during COVID, who had to start up their own. Uh, sort of natural fermentation practice because they couldn't get the starter cultures they normally rely upon to ferment their cheeses. Huh. Um, but these cheesemakers, uh, most cheesemakers rely upon these free dried starter cultures and have come to have faith in them as the source of the beneficial microorganisms they need to make cheese. You know, they are selected from, they're selected by microbiologists to provide the sort of cultures that it was understood that cheeses needed. You know, it should be understood that these freeze dried starter cultures uh, were sort of created in the 1960s and 70s, according to the uh, then current microbiological understanding of milk and cheese. And uh, they were isolated, microorganisms that were isolated from traditional starter cultures that were kept by cheesemakers and they're, you know, these cultures, regions of origin. You know, you could buy like Danish starter cultures or French starter cultures or Italian starter cultures that were originally isolated from traditional cultures that were kept in that region and were used for the making of specific cheeses. But individual microorganisms from those were propagated without really understanding that, uh, you know, the way we understand now that it's not just like one microorganism that makes a cheese, but dozens, if not hundreds of different microbi microbiological interactions and interventions that enable milk to evolve into cheese in its most successful way. And so when, when cheesemakers often use these freeze dried starter cultures in order to make cheese, they're introducing a sort of incomplete microbial ecology um, into their cheeses. 
And it's been shown in multiple studies that um, the starter cultures that are actually introduced by cheesemakers into their cheese often don't actually really even establish themselves in the cheeses that cheesemakers make, but instead wild cultures from like the cheesemakers body or the cheesemakers environment end up inoculating the cheeses and causing them to develop in their intended way, which is really kind of striking um, uh, and informative about uh, the, uh, the, the, the sort of questionable nature of these uh, starter cultures. Now, there's all sorts of problems associated with them that cheese, commercial cheesemakers today don't acknowledge. Um, they tend to think they're the right way to make cheese, but then there's these things they have to deal with and cope with on the kind of daily basis that make cheesemaking actually very challenging. And uh, first of all, um, cheesemakers who, who, who want to use these commercial starter cultures to make cheese, uh, for every single different cheese they want to make in-house, they have to buy a different starter culture or a different ripening culture. And, uh, uh, you know, different microorganisms are re responsible supposedly for uh, each cheese evolving in its own particular way. And so you want to make a, 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 a fresh cheese, you, you got to buy one starter culture. If you want to make a mozzarella, you got to buy another. If you want to make a hard alpine cheese, it's yet another starter culture. If you want to ripen a white mold on a camembert or a blue mold on a, on a, on a blue cheese or a wrinkly rind on a lactic cheese, you got to buy, you know, five or six different starter cultures, five or six different ripening cultures. All told, if you want to make 20 different cheeses, you got to buy 20 different packages. You know, Christian Hansen and Denisco are making a lot of money uh, <laughs> off this uh, practice. So is, you know, New England Cheese Making Supply Company and such, uh, who wrote the book on standard cheese making practices. Um, there's a lot of questionable, uh, I, I, you know, uh, uh, problems with this uh, as well. Um, you can't propagate these cultures, of course. You got to go back to the package every time you want to make a batch of cheese. You cannot save them from batch to batch. They are non-propagable. If you try to, your cheeses will fail because they, they don't have this diverse microbial ecology that can be propagated from batch to batch. Uh, you end up getting contamination issues with unwanted microbes uh, spoiling, the, spoiling the party. As well, uh, these microorganisms are susceptible to prob uh, problematic uh, viruses known as bacteriophages which can wipe out all the bacteria in a cheesemaking vat in one fell swoop and cause the fermentation of uh, cheesemaker's milk to completely fail. And so cheesemakers are, are need to like test the pH of their cheeses constantly to be sure their microbes haven't just died on them. <laughs> um, and then uh, they need to um, uh, throw out uh, their starter cultures every couple of weeks and use a new starter culture with different microorganisms in it in order to stay one step ahead of the phage, the bacterial phages, mm. so they end up losing batches of their cheese. Uh, in the end, the fermentation of these uh, freeze-dry starter cultures is actually slower and less effective and efficient than the use of traditional starter cultures. And not everybody really realizes this. They think that they're like the final word in cheese making, the futuristic and safe and effective way of doing things. But there's so many uh, examples of cheeses out there made more effectively with traditional starter cultures. There's so many studies that have looked into wood and its ability to transfer these beneficial microorganisms from batch to batch. There's so many examples of cheeses made with traditional starter cultures still to this day and, and across Europe and even some in North America, including uh, some we'll talk about maybe if there's time um, in the United States. Um, and uh, these starter cultures should be recognized for their effective uh, ability of fermenting milk and keeping unwanted microorganisms at bay. They are, are uh, it should be understood to be better uh, based on our current microbiological understanding, but we're sort of stuck in the 60s and 70s in, in many ways um, uh, in our practices and our understanding of milk. Um, and uh, there's a lot to uh, a lot that can be improved upon. Um, but often there's there's resistance. You know, cheesemakers have a lot of uh, a lot on the line when they make a batch of cheese. Uh, uh, there's like Money. thousands of liters, thousands of liters of milk uh, that need to be uh, uh, fermented and curdled and uh, cheesemakers can't rely on some uh, new idea. They can't depend on it. They don't have faith in it. They have faith in the other form of fermentation. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging thing to change a cheesemaker's mind on what they believe is really important for the integrity of their cheeses. Um, and uh, I, I haven't met that many established cheesemakers who have changed their way of propagating starter cultures in house unless they're sort of forced to. Mm -hmm. um, so there's so many questions in my head right now, and I'm sure there is for so many people on the call. And Kelsey's got a really awesome next question that's going to make even more questions. Um, so just a note um, that they David breed like David, microbes, huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, that David is available for. Uh, you can reach out to him. He mm -hmm. he has consulting services um, and and different. We're going to talk more about what he does. But if you're like me and you're just your questions are going, write them down and there will be opportunity to come back to David. Okay, Kelsey's got so, a question. 
Yeah, so back in the fall, I, I had the privilege of uh, going to Spain and I, I visited a cheesemaker, a Cabrales producer, and they still transport their cheese by horseback to caves. And the the che- the caves are actually caves. The caves. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're caves. And they are off the grid. Um, they there's no electricity there. They collect the the water that drips off the stalactites to wash the cabrales <laughs> with. So it's yeah. it's so traditional and really just um, you know, oh. speak to the naturalness of the environment. <laughs> what what do we lo- so I I see you really speaking to both preserving these traditions and returning to these traditions. Okay, well, what, so first of all, I. I want to say something significant that I learned when yeah. I was visiting similar caves in, in, in Spain. Um, uh, uh, a lot of these producers are, are, aren't using natural techniques in their, in their cheese making, even, even though they're, 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 they're utilizing these traditional cheese caves that have been uh, you, you know, aging cheeses in them for, for thousands of years. Uh, cheese makers um, often uh, 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 store raw milk refrigerated for up to two days it's quite common for them to uh, sterilize their milk uh, with uh, um, uh, a thermization, which is a very common practice in Europe because they can't trust the microorganisms in their two-day-old uh, refrigerated raw milk. They typically use freeze-dried starter cultures in order to evoke the desired fermentations in their cheeses. Uh, they often um, uh, use uh, freeze-dried uh, uh, blue penicillium rock 40 spores in order to make their cheeses and not just sort of wa- relying upon wild you know fermentation in order to do so um, in many cases in many places in the world traditional cheese making practices have been so eroded uh, that cheese makers are sort of just holding on to just a, a vestige of what their cheeses once were and it's, it's really fortunately quite sad um, um, things have changed so dramatically in the last you know, 50 years Spain, uh, you know, is you know, every country in Europe has its own reasons uh, why things have, have changed. You know, in Spain, there's a horrible history of Franco, you know, uh, 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 squashing all farmstead cheese making operations, essentially making small farmstead cheese making illegal across the country. And uh, cheese makers had to sort of recreate their cheese making almost traditional cheese making almost from scratch in the 1970s and 80s, and, and did so often according to an industrial regimen. Um, it, it's very hard to find a, a cheese that's out there really today that's still made with a, a traditional. Uh, completely traditional philosophy um, uh, uh, because there's so much impetus and so much drive in the world of cheese to do things according to what's perceived as the safer, more efficient, more effective way of making cheese. Like it's, it's penetrated everywhere. Um, and uh, in my travels around the world, uh, unfortunately, I, I witness this all, all too often. Um, and uh, my work um, internationally and, and in Canada um, is to help rebuild these uh, traditions of cheesemaking um, and to help cheesemakers understand why some of the things that they're doing with their milk are actually taking away from uh, the, uh, the, 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 the beneficial character of their cheeses. They're actually uh, degrading their cheeses in some way and not allowing them to really express the true flavors of what these cheeses could be. Yeah. Lots to unpack there. So much. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's, it's, it's different than we perceive it often in Europe. Um, yeah. Uh, we think of it as this heartland of, of traditional cheesemaking, but uh, you know, even in France, uh, the statistics I hear are that only like one in ten cheeses, like ten percent of cheeses made in France today, are made with raw milk. Um, most so are made with thermized or pasteurized milk, and then only a tiny fraction of those, you know, raw milk cheeses, even in France, are made with a traditional starter culture. Yeah. Um, so one question that we ask everybody at the end is where would you like to see Canadian cheese in five years? But for you, five years? I, I take a longer, I, I have to look a little further down the line. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think of this shift as something that is going to be happening sort of generationally. Um, I don't necessarily expect established cheesemakers to start doing things differently just because I say, it, you know, this is the way to do things. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a leap of faith and it's hard to do. And uh, cheesemakers are established making the cheeses that they sell and the customers love them and they're happy doing the things the way they're doing. They're set up to make cheese that way. But I, I believe that the next generation of cheesemakers is in, will be interested and excited about adapting some of these ideas into their dairies in much the same way that the next generation of winemakers and bread bakers um, uh, in, you know, across Canada uh, across the United States and elsewhere are adopting these natural fermentation practices into their realms of food fermentation. 
So, you know, any bread baker, young bread baker, bread baker worth their salt today is focused on sourdough. And uh, uh, young uh, wine growers in France and Europe, uh, maybe this isn't the case in Canada yet, but they're focused on like natural techniques and fermenting their grapes or their ciders. And you can find some, you know, extraordinary natural ciders uh, made in Ontario and British Columbia, maybe there's some in Quebec too, that are made by the sort of next generation, uh, trying to do something different and really explore new pathways. And I believe that in cheese making is going to be sort of the same, that uh, people who take up the torch, um, people who are interested and excite, get excited about farming um, in this next generation or have the farms passed down to them, um, will uh, may begin to think a little bit differently about how, uh, this, how cheese is made. And hopefully they'll be able to take the steps and uh, 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 um, recognize that this is really significant and can help improve the character and quality of what they're, what they're making. Dustin waving his hand there. <laughs> so of course so, there's challenges to all that you know i just absolutely. i just would say that you know in in wine making and cider making and bread baking and fermentation uh, at least in canada it's it's fairly easy to enter those markets you know it's fairly easy for a young person to start up a bakery or a fermentary and to make these naturally fermented products but in, in dairying in canada uh <sighs> I, I, it's it's, it's kind of hard to be optimistic about this uh, because of the strong suppression of innovation that comes about from uh, 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 strong regulation from the CFIA, uh, as well as the Milk Marketing Board, um, which makes it really hard for new entrants into the, um, uh, into the industry um, and sort of preserves a way of farming and cheese making that was kind of established in the 1960s or 70s and hasn't really, hasn't really changed all that much. Okay, so I'm, there was another question in there that I know was um, one that, that we wanted to talk about, but uh, just for the sake of holding to time, um, I think mm -hmm. what we're going to do is uh, I want you to talk about what it is that you do, David, tell everybody how they can find you, um, the different, all the different things that you offer, um, courses that people can join and learn more. And then for anybody who wants to stick around for like, let's call it a bonus question, Sure. We'll hang back. There, there was a really cool question that I don't want to miss tonight. Um, and it, it's sort of the last piece of the cheese making puzzle as well. Um, so let's talk about, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So let's talk <laughs> about, tell us, give us your, um, your plug. What do you do? Where can we find you? How can we participate? All right. So um, since uh, my book came out back in 2015, uh, my Michael family Smith. and I, uh, what's that? Say that part again was Michael so Schmidt. Since my no, since my book has come, came book. out, yeah. uh, since my book was published back in 2015, uh, my family and I have uh, uh, taken a break from farming. We've said goodbye to our goats, and we focused uh, our lives almost entirely upon cheese outreach and education. Um, and what started as a sort of short book tour back in 2015 has morphed into a, a now seven or eight year long um, a cheese tour <laughs> uh, that's con continued on even through the pandemic. Believe it or not. Um, that's uh, taken us, you know, around the world, teaching these traditional philosophies in uh, natural cheese making um, uh, to, you know, all these extraordinary places. And uh, we get invitations, uh, uh, thanks to uh, folks who are uh, excited about the ideas in the book, uh, to come out to their neck of the woods to uh, teach uh, 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 their neighbors, uh, their friends, uh, their fellow farmers about how to uh, make cheese using these more traditional natural philosophies. Um, uh, and um, uh, in the you know, seven years we've been traveling and teaching, we've been to uh, Australia and New Zealand, helping to stoke the sort of raw milk cheese making revolution there. Um, uh, we've been uh, uh, teaching across Canada and uh, uh, recently ended a US cheese tour. Um, uh, we've been across uh, Mexico, Latin America, South America and such teaching uh, cheese makers there who have been very receptive to natural ideas about how to do things differently. Uh, how to embrace the culture of their, of their milk um, and to uh, recreate the cheeses in more delicious ways. And we, we've, we've even uh, made many uh, forays to, to Europe, uh, teaching uh, cheesemakers there about how they can do things uh, with more natural techniques, sort of re reminding them about the, the way th things used to be made and helping them sort of take the steps and, under and to gather, the, gather and gain the understanding they need in order to do things in, in this original way. Um, so we've taught in uh, the United Kingdom, in 
uh, uh, Denmark, in France, in Spain, in Italy, um, and elsewhere, uh, showing cheesemakers how they can reclaim the, the cultures of their cheese and not have to be dependent on uh, culture houses for uh, starter cultures uh, or even uh, for rennet. Um, uh, something we'll talk about, I guess, a little later on. Um, but uh, so I teach full time nowadays, uh, typically with uh, five day classes. Uh, they guess are a bit of an investment, uh, but worth the time and energy. Uh, it's sort of it's a, a long walkthrough I give students to show them how uh, cheese can be made in this more traditional way, and cheese makers sort of get to see the cheeses. So they get to see see the starter culture evolving from raw milk, and they get to see how that starter culture invokes the beneficial fermentation in the cheeses they make in class. And like the, the cheeses begin to grow their rinds using these natural techniques before the cheeses, cheese makers very eyes, which is pretty enlightening. Um, uh, I, I do occasionally teach shorter classes, uh, sometimes across Canada. I have a, you know, a little tour coming up in uh, Alberta and British Columbia with some five day classes and one day classes that you can look up on my on my website, uh, which is. Uh, do you still have room to get any of those classes? I do, I do, in indeed. Cool. So there's a spot or two in each of them if you're interested in, in, in attending. And occasionally I do give these classes out back here in Eastern Canada. Uh, I've taught classes in Quebec. I'll be out there again someday. Um, and uh, I teach regular classes out in Vermont um, uh, as well, uh, a favorite little college of mine. Yes, Sterling Clapp College. In the, in the heartland of uh, farm, American Farmstead Cheese yeah. Cool. And do you offer one-on-one um, -on -one consulting as well? I do occasionally, um, um, uh, but I prefer to offer a sort of group counseling. <laughs> I like to get I like to get people together. It's part of the experience to bond with other cheesemakers. It's a sort of like um, a cheese summer camp often okay. um, for producers who haven't left the farm for a long time to can you know to to convene with their uh, fellow um, farmers and learn about these natural cheesemaking techniques. It's really great to have people come together. Of course, I, I do offer consultation um, uh, for classes online as well. The folks are interested in like a, a one day immersion session. I should have some posted soon um, for the fall. Um, and uh, of course, you can read my book. Uh, it's available in English, but also en français. Cool. It's, been translated, it's been translated into French. So, That's awesome. Uh, French speakers out there um, figure out how to do this. That's great. So, yes. so cool. So tell us about your next book. Uh, so uh, I'm in the process of writing it. It's taking longer than I expected. It's uh, it's quite a tome. Um, uh, uh, it is a, a, a more in depth, uh, an explorative look at uh, uh, natural cheese making. Uh, sure, the first one has got you know just about everything you need to get started. Um, uh, but the second book, which hopefully will be out in a year or two, um, uh, will be um, a really deep dive into these processes of natural cheese making. You know, the first book was kind of like, oh look. Uh, uh, this works. This is exciting. Um, try these things. They're new. They're cool. Um, but the second book is going to be a, a more in-depth exploration of why uh, this works and how this matters, um, how it makes a, a very significant difference. And it explores even more diverse uh, traditional technologies, like the use of wood, uh, like the use of uh, the traditional collaber culture. Um, it involves uh, making your own rennet in more traditional ways and uh, a, a greater diversity of cheese making recipes from all around the world that we've learned, of course, on our on our many travels. Wow, that's that's impressive. Yeah, it's going to be. I can't imagine why it's taking longer to uh, yeah. <laughs> write that. Put that down. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Um, for anybody who needs to leave, I think Kelsey's going to wrap this up and just tell you about our next call, um, and then stick around for a bonus question <laughs> that's super controversial da, da, da. <laughs> well that's fantastic david it's been a, an absolute pleasure chatting with you uh, i know we could chat for hours and days here and um you know you acknowledge that uh your your teachings can be polarizing and uh Good work. I think it's a, a very great counterpoint to the more um, contemporary cheese making that we're all familiar with. It's a great reminder of the roots that uh, we can return to and the, the preserving of old traditions, similar to what Dustin is doing with uh, the old uh, Oka recipe and what, uh, you know, some, <laughs> um, you know, some older cheese makers need to um, find a way to continue to keep their cheeses alive from generation to generation. But then there's also like modern day cheesemakers that are 
um, taking on this philosophy that you are reminding us of. And we're seeing some, uh, some exciting examples of that around the world. And I, I always look forward to following you and uh, seeing what your next adventure is. It's always a thrill and I just, I wish I could be there with you. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you here and uh, an honor to have you representing Canada as you travel the world. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for making space for this black sheep and uh, hope we can uh, meet up again soon. Absolutely. Yes. All right. I'm bonus gonna round. Go, I'm gonna oh, think, uh, no, I'm going to okay. think after the bonus question. <laughs> okay. Uh, next okay. call is going to be held on Monday, June 20th for all those who are able to attend. Um, it's going to be a, a little different. We're going to switch it up and instead of having one or two guests. We're uh, going to have uh, a bunch of uh, guests who are going to be joining us for a couple minutes each, and we're going to have a trivia night. So mm -hmm. we're going to be uh, tapping a few people on the shoulder who are experts in the industry, having them uh, ask some trivia questions, and we'll just have a, a fun evening of uh, Canadian cheese trivia and international cheese trivia. So it'll be something fun and interactive and just you know, want to build community in new ways and uh, get a session going that's a bit more interactive and a bit more fun instead of uh, listening to us chat all the time here. So I, don't know. I think this excited. is pretty fun, especially with the next question. But if anybody needs to go, thank you for joining us tonight and I hope you will join us on June 20th for Kelsey's Amazing Trivia Night, which I'm also very curious about. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Nobody's leaving. I love it. Okay, David. I saw a recent post you made on Instagram where you talked about rennet sources and the sacrifice of young male animals. This is a polarizing but important conversation about ethics and sustainability in cheese making and farming. Can you tell us about different rennet sources and how harvesting rennet from young male ruminants can add sustainability to our industry? So yeah, it is a, it's a, it's a challenging one to breach, um, but one that I've been, uh, an idea that I've been espousing and uh, talking about a lot more lately because I, I feel it's a, the most significant thing that we're not talking about. Um, you know, and it's something that really fits into these ideas of natural cheese making. You know, and if a cheesemaker is gonna be considering uh, keeping a natural starter culture in the house uh, for fermenting their milk, um, the idea of using natural rennet in their cheese making really fits with that. Um, it's really they're really made to made to work together, um, and uh, 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 the choice of rennet the cheesemakers make, um, you know, is, is a tough one. Uh, cheesemakers don't have very good options out there often, and uh, in our uh, society, meaning sort of Anglo North American society, I want to say that. Um, uh, we have certain uh, ideas about dairying and cheesemaking that, that are unfortunately um, uh, uh, sort of challenging to um, uh, 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 discuss uh, from this natural perspective. And that this one really important idea is that um, uh, in order to make rennet in a natural way, in order to make cheese according to a natural way, it's very important to use uh, the traditional, most natural source of rennet, uh, which is the uh, fourth stomach of a young ruminant animal that is a young goat, young sheep, young cow uh, that is sacrificed uh, at a very young age uh, for their stomach, um, but also for other reasons, as I'll explain. Um, that uh, was the original coagulant uh, uh, that was used. Um, for transforming milk into cheese. And just about all our, our cheese making traditions all around the world uh, originate from the practice of using uh, a traditional uh, stomach for uh, curdling milk. And uh, it's something that we really, really don't um, acknowledge. It's something that we don't really uh, pay homage to or even talk about. Most folks don't really even understand this, uh, especially in a, on the English side of things. Um, but I just want to show you kind of what, what this is, because most people have never even seen or heard about this, even in the, even in the cheese world. And what I have here is one of these stomachs. Of course you have one with you. Of course, I travel with them I everywhere. I want to know what your in-laws think of that. 
<laughs> it's a, yeah, it's a point of contention <laughs> here as well. Um, this is, you know, this is a, a, a stomach of a young kid, a young goat kid um, uh, uh, that came from an animal that was sacrificed at about a, a week of age. Um, that is the traditional original ingredient that's used for cheese making in Spain and Italy and many parts of the Mediterranean. That is a part of what, uh, you know, gives cheeses of that region their particular flavors, their particular textures and such. Um, and it's still, you know, being used um, and uh, 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 introduced into milk and like modern commercial dairies in Europe today. Um, and, you know, as, 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 as weird as this might seem to like a North American, especially English speaking uh, North American, um, this like is what makes cheese. Like this is the, the magic ingredient. This is what all our current, you know, cheese making practices are, are based on. Uh, every time we curdle milk, we sort of do this, the thing that this stomach originally did. Um, and uh, this is how cheese making originated. Um, uh, nobody knows exactly how cheese was discovered, but it's been, you know, told many times that the first cheese that was ever made was made by accident by a shepherd who accidentally put some of their fresh milk into the stomach of a young calf that they had recently slaughtered. And they went for a horseback ride with a, you know, the milk in a, in a, in a sack hanging off the side of their horse. And when they got to their destination, uh, the milk was no longer milk, but instead had coagulated and curdled into this weird cheesy stuff. Um, and, uh, 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 you know, our entire repertoire of cheese making traditions from all around the world, all our extraordinary dairy history evolves from that first moment, that first discovery of, you know, using a young animal stomach for making cheese. Um, now, um, uh, uh, cheese makers today in North America uh, generally don't use rennet like this, or even a rennet derived from an animal stomach, um, of course. Uh, they wouldn't use an ingredient like this, but I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Um, uh, it's actually possible to do this. Um, uh, it's not illegal necessarily, um, uh, 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 but it's not exactly uh, uh, encouraged. Um, uh, but uh, most cheesemakers who coagulate milk today use uh, uh, commercial rennets, uh, typically not derived from an animal source, uh, uh, that are derived from other sources that aren't generally talked about either, uh, that actually may be more questionable uh, more stomach churning um, than uh, the stomachs uh, that are originally used for cheese making. Uh, uh, most cheese makers today in North America use, for example, uh, genetically modified rennets, uh, although they're not sold as such. They're produced uh, with uh, technologies, uh, genetically, you know, genetic modification technologies that enable microorganisms to produce the enzymes that are normally produced in the stomachs of these young calves or kids that allow cheese makers to curdle their milk without having to sacrifice a young calf. Um, so most cheese today is made with a sort of so-called vegetarian rennet, um, and it's usually sold as such. It's a selling point, and most cheesemakers choose to use this rennet in part because of this. Um, it's like the you know the the, the way to do things here. Um, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I, 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 you know, it, 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 uh, it's kind of misleading to consumers to say that the, that the cheese they're making is vegetarian, because it's impossible to produce milk or make cheese you know, from an animal um, without invoking some sort of animal slaughter. You know, raising animals for milk necessitates the, the killing of young animals. And this is something we haven't really fully digested or really fully understand in English speaking North America, but something that's understood in, in say Quebec or France or Spain or Italy or such where you know, cheesemakers still think about these things. Um, uh, in order to produce milk, you know, a cow has to give birth to a young calf year after year after year. Um, and uh, most of those calves historically weren't needed by the dairy. Uh, uh, they were considered uh, unnecessary, uh, a liability. They would drink all the mother's milk if they were raised. And so historically, uh, traditionally, cheesemakers would take the young calves away from their mothers at about three or four days once the you know, colostrum had transformed to milk. Um, uh, the milk was valuable for cheesemaking uh, and uh, the young animals were sacrificed. Uh, their meat was appreciated. Uh, their suckling, you know, suckling meat uh, was the uh, most extraordinary, um, and uh, 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 their stomachs were also utilized, perhaps most importantly, um, as a, a coagulant, as a preservative agent for uh, uh, dealing with all the milk that they, you know, the farmers then took from their mothers. And so the sacrifice, sacrificing of the calf was key to producing the enzyme uh, that was necessary for preserving the mother's milk, but of course it was also needed in order to get the milk from the mother in the first place. <laughs> 
Uh, and historically, you know, cheesemakers had a choice, farmers had a choice. They could you know, raise the animals for meat and not get any milk, or they could raise their animals for milk and sacrifice the calves at a young age. Is it pepsin? Is that the... So it's not pepsin, it's trimazin, but close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it is one, those, that is one of the enzymes involved in, in, in this coagulation. Is there a reason why, other than to not use the mother's milk uh, to feed this animal, but is there a reason why, um, just like a few days old, is there more of that enzyme? Um, there is more chimazin at a younger age, at one week of age. Um, and as the animal ages, the enzyme trans the enzyme composition of the stomach changes as well from chimazin to pepsin. Very and chimazin good. makes good cheese, but pepsin, the stomach of an older animal, makes cheese taste like vomit. You know, uh -huh. our stomach produces pepsin when we're old, and so it's it's invocative of of something not nice. And there are some cheesemakers in the world, in some places like Mexico and Brazil, that use older animals to make cheese, and the cheese is. I, I have a tough time with it, um, and you probably would too, because it's it's not more, it's not what we're accustomed to. And how much rennet? One one calf stomach. Um, it, it's made into like a tea or a, like a tincture yep. sort of yep. situation. The stomach, the stomach is taken out of the animal, and it's got cheese inside. Um, and uh, some traditions involve leaving the cheese in there. This is the cheese that coagulated from the milk in the stomach, the way you know milk, you know what milk is supposed to do. Um, so historically, in like Southern Europe, they'd leave the cheese inside, whereas in Northern Europe, um, they'd clean the stomach out and uh, would use a sort of naked, clean stomach for making cheese. Uh, both work, but make they make different cheese, of course. Um, and um, uh, once the stomach is like taken out of the animal, it's salted heavily. Um, cured in the salt and then dried for many months. The process takes about a year to do. It's a long time. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, you got to prepare ahead of time. You got to think about it the year before. Um, uh, but then once the stomach is dried, you sort of take the stomach and you make it into a paste. You grind it uh, in a mortar and pestle or blender or whatnot. You then pour whey over it. Although the modern method says like water with vinegar. <laughs> whey, of course, is better. Um, uh, and the way, the acidic way pulls enzymes out of the stomach um, uh, and it into the way. And you then pour that liquid through a cloth to get the little bits of stomach out. You don't want those in your cheese, but you want the enzymes and those will all come out into the way. And then uh, that way with the enzymes in it is what's used as the, both the coagulant and often even the starter culture in the making of traditional cheeses. And, I wondered. If you go to visit these traditional cheesemakers around the world who still use this, the, they almost always have this jar or this pot with like this yellowish liquid in it and these like bits of animal floating in it. And that's essentially the, the, the enzyme preparation that they're dependent upon for coagulating their milk. So uh, this stuff works um, and uh, it's uh, amazingly abundant. You know, this one stomach that I'm holding, which is a goat stomach, this little goat stomach has enough coagulant in it to transform, uh, according to my calculations, uh, about, uh, 500 liters of milk into cheese, um, which is uh, uh, more than or about as much as that young animal would drink from its mother during its lifetime. Mm. Similarly, a much larger calf stomach with all of its enzymes would be essentially enough rennet for that young calf to drink, you know, transform all its mother's milk into cheese in its belly. Um, they're born with all of it and sort of degrades over time, but they have enough at the get go and it's enough for all the milk that their mother would produce. Um, and so this rennet is kind of a, a sustainable, it's a sustainable supply. It's all the rennet that anyone ever would need. And traditionally, historically, on dairy farms around the world, uh, dairy farmers, cheesemakers would sacrifice, you know, all the male calves, all the animals that you know they didn't need, uh, many of the females too, and uh, they take all those stomachs, and that would be all the rennet that they needed, essentially, to deal with all the milk that those young animals weren't drinking. That is fascinating. And it, it works, you know, any cheesemaker anywhere in the world could do this mm -hmm. <laughs> if their dairy inspector allowed it, you know, and if the, the, the stomachs came from a sort of registered place. Exactly. In, in, some, places, in some places in the world, it is. In some places in the world, it is. And I, I, that's where I got the stomach from. Um, you know, I, I do do this on my own. It's something that I sometimes actually incorporate into my classes. If there's the audience is receptive towards the idea of animal sacrifice, uh, uh, it takes things to a deeper level. Um, but um, this stomach itself actually came from a company in Spain called Cuajos Caporal, uh, 
sells these from a certified facility to cheesemakers around Spain for them to use in their certified dairies. And they have all sanitary certificates to go along with it. And cheesemakers are permitted to use these in you know, the European Union in order to curdle their milk. But getting these into America, <laughs> Canada, is a challenging thing to do. They, you know, they don't have import certificates for this. Nobody expects this to come across. And uh, you know, it's, not, it's not something a cheesemaker is really thinking about doing. Um, but there are some cheesemakers who are actually thinking about this. And so of is course, it completely because, illegal in North America at this point? It, there's no structure for it. There's no precedent for it. And there's, there's nobody doing it. No one? Not uh, even like Parish Hill in Vermont? No, nah, I mean, they're experimenting. Uh, Peter Dixon, a great uh, natural cheese making consultant, uh, uh, is experimenting with the idea of natural rennet, but he's not, he's not doing it yet. Okay. Um, uh, you know, uh, there are some cheesemakers out there who are thinking about it, but if they're going to do it, they're going to get these stomachs imported kind of illegally from Europe, from Austria or Germany or Switzerland or France or Italy, where there still exists these a trade in these stomachs. Um, but in North America, you know, our rennet doesn't come from here. Um, every cheese, just like our cultures, every cheese that's coagulated in North America is uh, curdled with an enzyme that comes from somewhere else. And in the case of a rennet, you know, for, even from an animal rennet that you might be using in your cheese making in, in North America, where does that animal rennet come from? Well, it doesn't come from the cows on your farm. It doesn't come from your neighbor's farm, even in Canada. It probably comes from dairy calves that were sacrificed in New Zealand, one of the few places in the world that still sacrifices calves at a young age um, for their meat, for their milk and such. You know, in North America, we don't do that anymore. We do other things with calves that are kind of questionable. You know, we send them off to confined animal feedlot operations. Dairy farmers don't like to talk about this, but you know, they're, they're, what do they do with their calves? They've got to do something with them. And uh, they're often sold at auction and uh, the cheesemakers don't ask any questions. But every dairy farmer has got to deal with calves. And I think we don't, I, I'm thinking we don't, I believe we don't deal with them right. Anyway, the enzyme typically comes from New Zealand uh, or Europe. Uh, the, and the stomachs of these animals are often shipped to Europe in order to be transformed into rennet. And then the rennet comes from, you know, from Europe to North America in order to curdle our milk. And you know, many cheesemakers are using these without really asking questions about it. You know, and cheesemakers talk about their cheeses as being like a taste of a place. You know, this is my cheese that tastes like here, but how can your cheese possibly like be from here if it's curdled, it's like the essential ingredient that's used to make it comes from halfway around the world and back again. Like in some ways, the concept of terroir, I mean, I hate to say this, but the concept of terroir that we are invoking in our conversations about cheese is it's kind of, it's kind of meaningless. <laughs> Sorry. When like one um, quarter of the ingredients is from, you know. Everything you need to make it, everything you rely upon to make it comes from somewhere else. Hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a tough one. But, you know, the steps that it would take in order to, to, to you know, do this, uh, I mean, no one is able to do it. Um, uh, in North America. There's no framework for it. There's no history of it. Uh, there's no precedent and uh, there's, it's not welcome. You know, in order to do this, you'd have to kill the animals on your dairy farm at a week old. And nobody would accept that, you know, with our current ethics, uh, the current idea of, you know, eating young animals. It's something we don't do anymore. It's something we used to do generations ago, but something that's seen as cruel and unusual. Um, uh, you know, uh, I do it. Uh, people in Quebec do it. You can find milk, you know, Vaudelet, uh, milk fed veal uh, mm -hmm. supermarkets in, in Quebec. Um, uh, but it's hard to get uh, the rest of Canada thinking about this idea. Um, uh, it's hard to find a slaughterhouse that would sacrifice or kill calves at four days of age um, uh, or goats that are the size of, uh, you know, a little puppy and like the doe, you know, doughy eyes and all that. Um, it's a really hard thing to do, um, but I think this is something that's really key to the sustainability and ethics of uh, dairy farming and cheese making. Uh, it's something that we're not taking ownership of, something we're not taking responsibility for in our industry. Um, you know, every dairy farmer produces calves that aren't needed in the dairy, um, and uh, they're often sold, no questions asked, and uh, you know, the place they go to is, is often not a very beautiful uh, place, uh, uh, not as nice as that farm. You know, that, 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 that farmstead cheesemaker uh, keeping Jersey cows uh, out on pasture sells the animals at three days of age. If they're able to, you know, often Jersey farmers can't even sell them because they're, 
uh, holes. They're not, as, they don't grow as fast as Holsteins. Uh, so they don't even get a cent for them. Um, but if they can, they'll sell them at auction and they'll go off to a, a, a farm you know, out in Alberta somewhere uh, where they're uh, raised on milk replacer and grain and don't get to eat a blade of grass and they are killed at you know, six months of age um, for, their, you know, uh, for, their, for, their, for their meat. And that, that, that confined animal feedlot operation sort of gives all animal farming a bad name. Mm-hmm. You know, veganism, for example, as a, has arisen in large part as a reaction to that form of animal agriculture and not towards the sort of form of animal agriculture that we're talking about, you know, when we talk about cheese, uh, farmstead cheese making. But in, in a way that the two are, are, are sort of connected when we don't recognize uh, uh, the importance of sacrificing young animals and, you know, traditional and dairying systems. So, yeah, it's a tough one. Very interesting. We I talk think about it. But you can't, you can't really do it. You can't really do anything about it. It's tough. Yeah. I think most of us on this call probably have never really considered where the rennet came from to eat all of the cheese that we um, enjoy so often. And um, it, I think it's a really interesting thing for us to think about and maybe talk about more with <laughs> other people in our community. Um, I can see how it would ruffle some feathers. Um, <laughs> I, I don't... Any, any part of the natural farming um, process, you know, is, is quite natural and, and should be regarded as such. But yeah, it's the, it's the cute little face, isn't it, that people probably um, mm-hmm. struggle the most with. I don't know. Yeah, you know, but we all come from cultures that are, you know, at some point, historically, ate these cute young animals. You know, mm-hmm. our, our, our holiday of Easter. Um, Spring lamb. Uh, you know, we celebrate these cute baby animals, um, these cute chicks and these little lambs and rabbits and such. Well, why do we venerate these you know, cute young animals in Easter? Well, it's because Easter, uh, you know, the emergence, uh, a, a holiday, you know, at a time that's you know, emerging from a long winter where we haven't had much meat. Uh, these baby animals that are born onto the farm were often eaten at that, uh, you know, at that, at that, at that time. Um, uh, they were like the celebratory feast, this young spring lamb that was sacrificed at that age, often at, you know, just a month old or less, in part because that young animal needed to be killed for its milk, its mother's milk, but also for its stomach to preserve that for its milk. Have you, uh, we had a question from Dustin. He wants to know how the cheese <laughs> straight from that baby's stomach tastes. Have you ever had it? Yeah, so I eat it. Um, I encourage my students to eat it when we do a, a, an animal sacrifice in class. Um, and uh, it tastes like uh, gorgonzola. It tastes like Parmigiano Reggiano. Uh, it tastes like Spanish blue cheeses. Um, more intense, of course, not you know, not the same, not the same at all. But it, this cheese, this first cheese that forms inside the stomachs of young animals, is coagulated with these enzymes produced by the stomach that are used in cheeses in many parts of Europe. And so you you actually taste this similarity. It's like there's a little something on your tongue that's evocative of these cheeses because these cheeses are made with these ingredients. And it's not that off-putting, you know. Some some places in the world consider the, the cheese inside to be a sort of delicacy, mm-hmm. but I, I think it's too valuable to be eaten. It's like this really important uh, coagulant that's necessary for preserving milk. Fascinating. Um, yeah. Thank you. I for... prefer to eat. Yeah. Anyway, go yeah. ahead. Uh, thank you for for giving us this extra bonus um, answer. I think it's. I've learned so much from you tonight, and I hope everybody else on the call has as well. Um, and yeah, Kelsey, any other last comments? Just got some really lovely thank yous from people coming in here. Um, yeah, David, thank you so much for your time. This has been My pretty pleasure. cool. Um, and I'll be curious to hear the feedback from this class. Everybody is really great about giving feedback. And, and so we always hear what the thoughts were. So I'll be curious about this one. <laughs> okay, yeah, let me know how everyone responded. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much, David. I can't really see everybody talking to me. Yeah. yeah, he's um at the black sheep at the black sheep school on yeah on Instagram. On Instagram. That's right. You can follow him on there and his his good pal Trevor, who is milk trekker, who I'm also obsessed with following his journey. He's in yeah. Albania right now, right. and uh, it looks so cool. Everything he's seeing is just incredible. Yeah, thanks so much. Cool. All right. On that note, everybody, have a great evening. And uh, this was recorded. If anybody needs the recording, you can reach out to us by respond. <laughs> We're not the best at responding to email now. I'm going to be completely honest. <laughs> <laughs> the generational thing. <laughs>
<laughs> we're doing our best. <laughs> but uh, thank you, everybody. We'll see you on June 20th for Trivia with Kelsey. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, David. Bye.